Uh, first question always is, can you hear me in the back? Yeah? OK. Um, actually, a week ago, I thought Mother Nature was going to continue with her antics, and I'd have to come next spring, but uh, we made it. The, uh, the title uh, has a couple of presuppositions, which I want to say something about. Uh, one, it's talking about other cognitive processes, so it's assuming that uh, the mind, like the, me the mental systems, the mind-brain, is like everything else in the body. It's a modular system with uh, subcomponents, uh, dedicated subcomponents that have their own uh, particular properties, uh, their own uh, 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 properties of growth and development and of functioning, and that integrate with each other in the life of the organism. And the modular approach to the mind assumes that uh, uh, mental systems uh, uh, are the same. I think that's pretty uncontroversial. Uh, the other presupposition is controversial. It's that language is one of those systems. When I talk about language and other cognitive systems, we're assuming that language exists as a separate system, not just some kind of accidental connection of uh, interaction of other systems. Uh, that's highly controversial. In fact, it's a, that language exists in, in, in the sense that it can be an independent object of serious study, uh, is a distinctly a minority position, and in fact has been for uh, you know, a century. Uh, the, uh, which is kind of strange when you think about it, because on the surface, it seems entirely obvious if you consider a, a newborn infant, let's say, uh, the infant is uh, faced with the famous uh, blooming, buzzing confusion of William James. And somehow, and how incidentally is not known, uh, some, in fact, barely studied, because it hasn't been recognized to be a problem, though it is, uh, the infant somehow picks out of this uh, a complex collection of unorganized data, uh, some subparts which are language-related. Uh, that's not, it's not easy to figure out how that happens. As I say, it's barely been studied, just beginning to be studied now. So it picks out, the infant picks this out of the environment, reflexively, of course. In, in fact, we now know that that's going on even intrauterine to a certain extent. And... Uh, then continues, uh, again, pretty much reflexively to uh, pick up the uh, capacities that uh, you and I are now using, uh, and does so with very little evidence. Uh, not only is the evidence scattered among other data, but that for mu much of what anyone knows, there's almost no evidence at all. Uh, that goes from the meaning of the simplest words when you look at them closely, uh, up to uh, complex uh, uh, structures uh, their, uh, and, and their interpretation. I'll give a couple of examples. But it's uh, uh, a pretty clear. Uh, furthermore, it's a, a humanly unique capacity. So if uh, an infant has a pet uh, chimpanzee or songbird or kitten or whatever, uh, the animal can't, doesn't even make the first step can't pick out of the environment language-related data. That's not because of sensory motor defects or deficiencies or differences even. A chimpanzee auditory system is pretty much the same as a human auditory system, uh, so much the same that it's recently been discovered. It even picks out the uh, distinctive features, the kinds of uh, sound features that play a role in language chimpanzee auditory system is somehow constructed so it specifically identifies those. And the uh, motor system really doesn't matter. I mean, the people learn language perfectly well. Children learn language actually normally if they're exposed only to sign, uh, not to sound, and if they use only sound, sign. Uh, the course of development is virtually identical in quite remarkable ways. Uh, and in fact, the, the language, the, what's sometimes called the externalization of language, the way it goes through the sensory motor system, it seems to be modality independent. 
Uh, and of course, uh, say apes have uh, yeah, the same visual system, essentially the same capacity for motor action, even more developed in some ways than humans. So that can't be the problem. It's got to be something about the internal uh, computational system that's uniquely human. But uh, despite all these facts, and they're glaringly obvious, nevertheless, it's, there's kind of a dogma that language just can't be a separate system. Uh, it's got to be just a combination of other things common maybe to primates. Uh, in fact, it's, if, if you take a look across, uh, uh, in comparative terms across other organisms, about the only known animal that even has any of the rudimentary properties of human language are uh, certain kinds of songbirds. And they're you know, billions of years away in terms of uh, uh, evolutionary uh, history. So whatever similarities they are has to be convergence, not uh, a common ancestry. Uh, so, so there's something very special about language. Uh, also, it's, it's pretty recent in the human line. There's really no evidence for, for its existence uh, beyond maybe 100,000 years ago which is a you know, flick of an eye in evolutionary terms and uh, uh, many millions of years after the separation from the nearest species. Uh, well, despite all of this, which again is glaringly obvious, uh, it has, there is a kind of a doctrine that uh, it, uh, it's, if you took votes among cognitive scientists today, uh, most, almost all would agree with it, uh, that it can't be true. Uh, I think it's a interesting case of denial of the obvious, for which maybe psychologists might want to have something to say, but uh, you can easily determine it from the literature. Uh, also, it goes way back. So if we go back to the 1950s, when the kind of work that I'll be talking about, what's sometimes called the uh, generative enterprise, uh, when it was sort of barely beginning, actually a couple of graduate students at Harvard who were uh, didn't believe any of the, uh, they were highly skeptical of the standard behavioral science uh, concepts of the time. At that point, uh, the same view was just rampant. Uh, so the leading, uh, the leading philosopher, most influential philosopher who uh, had anything to say about these things was uh, a very important philosopher at Harvard, W.V. Quine, and his conception, which was highly influential, and not just in the Cambridge area, but everywhere else as well, was that uh, language is just, every language is just a fabric of sentences uh, associated with one another and with stimuli by the mechanism of conditioned response. This was all within the framework of the <coughs> radical behaviorism that was prevalent at the time. It's a view that's almost incoherent. I mean, how, how can you even tell whether some of the behaviors are sentences, unless there's an independent concept of language. But despite the incoherence and the complete lack of evidence, in fact, uh, uh, masses of contrary evidence, uh, this was a widely believed, accepted view. Outside, in the fields around linguistics, there was no cognitive science at the time, which was just barely beginning. Uh, in uh, linguistics itself, a rather similar view was held. So it was a, a, a common standard view, you can kind of read it in the major literature at the time, was what was called the uh, Boazian view, uh, named after the famous uh, uh, anthropologist, linguist, Franz Boas. <coughs> Whether he believed it or not is another story, but it was called the Boazian view, uh, namely that languages can differ from one another in arbitrary ways, and when you approach a new language to investigate, you should do it without any preconceptions about what a language can be, because they can all be entirely different. Actually, that's the way I was taught in the late 1940s, early 50s, when I was a student. The, uh, uh, and of course, that would mean there is really no such thing as language. It's sort of anything that comes along. Uh, the, uh, uh, later on, there were in, in the philosophical tradition, uh, more modern philosophy, another standard view that developed uh, while these pretty much remained uh, was not by, 
not universally anymore by the 60s and the 70s, it's beginning to change, but uh, a view that entered was and sort of was developed, also tracing back to Quine, and in fact with deep roots in history of uh, psychology, uh, is that uh, any mental process, anything, you can't have a mental process at all unless it's accessible to consciousness. It may not be conscious, but at least has to be accessible to consciousness. That's a very widely held view. In fact, if you look over the history of psychology, it's pretty hard to find anyone who questioned it. Uh, even Freud, in fact, talked about the unconscious, but if you read Freud carefully, he appears to have assumed that uh, he's not a model of clarity, but he seems to have assumed that uh, whatever is unconscious can, in principle, be accessed by consciousness. In fact, that's what underlies the practice of uh, psychoanalysis, trying to bring things to consciousness. It's very hard, you might check, to find anyone who believed that the uh, process, the mental processes are processes of thinking, planning, interpreting, and so on, uh, that they can, in fact, be inaccessible to consciousness. Although I think, again, the evidence is overwhelming that that's what they are, almost entirely. And in the case of language, almost completely, which is why you can't investigate a language by introspection. Uh, you can look at the data but it's your, of your own language, but it's as foreign to you as it is to anyone else, uh, what's inside it. Well, the, uh, of the approaches to language at the time were uh, what are called procedural. Uh, you, there were certain procedures of data analysis. You applied them to a corpus of material, and you could rearrange the material and put it into organized form, which, again, that's what theoretical linguistics was. In fact, the main theoretical book was called Methods in, Theoretic in Structural Linguistics. Methods, because that's all there is. The European linguistics was approximately the same. And that, again, has the same kind of framework of assumptions. Uh, it, it follows from this and was believed that there can't be any real problems about language. There can't be any puzzles. Because all you are doing is taking data and organizing it. And unless you make a mistake or you have the wrong procedures, uh, there can't really be anything problematic. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there is a modern variant of this, uh, which, as I mentioned, is overwhelmingly dominates the cognitive sciences. I'll return to that. Well, as I say, it's kind of strange because of the, uh, not just for exotic reasons, but because of the nature of what's obvious before our eyes. Uh, but there's nothing novel about that. Now, that's the way the sciences have developed. Uh, so, for example, for uh, uh, one of the, I mean, a great turning point in the sciences uh, was around the 17th century uh, when scientists, for the first time, really, allowed themselves to be puzzled about what looked like very simple things. Uh, so, for thousands of years, the greatest scientists had uh, a simple answer to some obvious fact. Uh, obvious fact is that if, say, I pick up a cup of boiling water and uh, hold my hand over it, uh, if I take my hand away, the steam rises, and if I let go of the cup, the cup falls. So why does the cup fall and the steam rise? Well, there's an answer given by Aristotle they're seeking their natural place. And for thousands of years, that was considered a satisfactory answer. Uh, modern science actually begins when Galileo and later others uh, agreed, were, were able to convince themselves that there's something puzzling about that. Why does that happen? And as soon as those questions began to be asked and investigated, it was very quickly discovered that uh, all of our intuitions about how these things work are just false. Uh, th uh, intuitions about rate of fall and almost any other simple thing. And it's at that point that it, when it came to be discovered that what seemed to be obvious was comp in fact not at all understood, it's at that moment that uh, modern science starts. And that uh, often has yet to happen in the uh, human sciences. The things seem kind of obvious to us, so we don't really question them. 
Uh, but if you can bring yourself to be puzzled about them, you find that we really don't understand anything. Uh, well, uh, those are the two presuppositions. I'm going to assume except both, namely that uh, the mind is modular like everything else in the biological world, every other thing in or organisms, and that uh, language exists as a separate module. Uh, this uh, uh, It shouldn't really be surprising that uh, language and the mind should, and the human intelligence should follow the biological norm. As I mentioned, uh, language has it itself has very special properties. I'll mention some of them, and uh, uh, the things that should have seemed puzzling are very puzzling and still are when you look closely. And uh, it's uh, a very recent development. If you look at the evolutionary record. Uh, uh, of course, we don't have tape recordings, but there's a lot of uh, archaeological evidence. And the archaeological evidence for the existence of language, uh, sort of in, implicates the existence of language, is very modern, uh, maybe within 100,000 <coughs> years or so, and uh, unique to humans. It's not found in the other uh, uh, hominid branches, uh, Neanderthals, for example, who lived up till maybe 30,000 years ago. Uh, the, in fact, we still have Neanderthal genes, but uh, it seems to be very specifically human, millions of years after uh, the, the, the break from other organisms. Uh, there is a huge literature by now, just the last 20 years, it's burgeoned on what's called evolution of language, uh, which is itself kind of curious. Uh, evolution of language is a very hard topic to study. There is no direct evidence. There's no comparative evidence. Uh, nobody knows where to look for neurological evidence. Uh, nevertheless, there's, a, there's libraries full of books on it, especially the last 20 years. If you take much simpler topics, there's almost no literature on them. So take, say, the communication system of bees. It's quite complex. Uh, some scattered papers, uh, practically nothing on it. The reason is it's just understood to be too hard. It's too hard to study. I mean, sciences can only study what's kind of right at the borders of understanding. Uh, for bees, a study of uh, evolution of the communication system of bees, which is quite complex, you all know about the waggle dance and that sort of thing, uh, it is far more easy to study. I mean, there's about 500 species of bees, so you have plenty of comparative evidence. They have different communication systems. Some appear to have no communication system. Uh, they get along about as well as the others, which raises some questions about what the function of those complicated systems is. But anyway, there's plenty of comparative evidence. The brain is tiny. It's the size of a grass seed, and maybe 100,000 neurons, uh, minuscule as compared to the human brain. Uh, very short gestation period, a couple of days, so you can breed and so on and so forth. You can do any experiment you like. You want to take them apart. That's allowed. You don't need consent forms or ethical issues or anything. So it's a perfect organism to study. As com and humans are impossible to study in all of those dimensions. And nevertheless, there's almost nothing about it because of the recognition among biologists that it's just too hard. Uh, on the other hand, the kind of tacit assumption that there can't really be much to language uh, makes it a possible topic to study. Uh, if you don't know anything about language, and incidentally, if you don't, if you have uh, quite uh, uh, confused notions about evolution, uh, there is a kind of a pop biology, which is very widespread, that assumes that uh, uh, evolutionary change uh, takes place in small steps and adds up, and finally you get complex things happening. It was believed at one time, not very long ago, in fact. Uh, nobody believes it anymore. By now, there's overwhelming evidence for uh, what's called saltation, you know, sudden changes. Uh, and it's even kind of understood why. This has been understood in the biological sciences ever since at least the 60s and the 70s, when uh, after the discovery of uh, the regulatory mechanisms uh, and cells that, uh, that govern the uh, action of uh, genes that govern the action of other genes, uh, 
if you change the regulatory circuits a little bit, you get huge phenomenal differences. Uh, and there's by now many examples of very small changes, genetic changes that lead to substantial uh, differences in uh, what the organism is. Uh, famous uh, discussion back in the 1970s by uh, François Jacob, who's one of the discoverers of these mechanisms, a Nobel laureate, uh, who argued that if you, you could change, a, his image was you could change an elephant to a fly by just uh, changing the timing and organization of a few regulatory circuits. And that kind of, that, that you can't prove yet, but uh, similar, uh, smaller results have definitely been shown. So the idea that everything has to happen by small steps is out the window. I might say that back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, in biology too, it was generally assumed that uh, organisms can vary in arbitrary ways. So the next organism you look at, you have to approach it quite differently uh, from others uh, without preconceptions. Now that is totally out the window, uh, so much out the window that by now there are even proposals which are taken seriously, one by a molecular biologist at Boston University, that uh, there may be a universal genome. That is, that all the metazoa complex organisms that uh, come from the Cambrian explosion uh, 500 billion years ago, uh, that they're all fundamentally the same. They all have a, basically the same genome with slight variations. And that doesn't look exotic anymore. It may not, may be true, maybe not, but it's not an exotic proposal uh, given what's known now about conservation of uh, genes and genetic structures you know, going all the way to bacteria up to humans and, uh, uh, simil and deep homologies, you know, very deep similarities in the way organisms are put together. Uh, it's, I think the same is true of language but it's much more controversial in this case. Well, um, give you some illustrations from today. I go back a couple of months. There was a review article in the journal Science, main journal, Scientific Weekly, American, American Association for Advancement of Science, by a, a well-known neuro, cognitive neuroscientist at the Max Planck Institute in the Netherlands. Uh, he was reviewing several books on evolution of language, uh, the, uh, and he kind of dismissed most of them because they were tainted by a, a false assumption, uh, namely the assumption that language, is, that language actually exists. Well, that is, that there are the rule systems specific to language which uh, uh, determine the character of sound systems, other externalization systems, uh, determine the structures and meanings of uh, uh, expressions, how they're interpreted, and that can't be. Uh, it violates the dogma, uh, and in fact, the, uh, in order to sort of establish the point, the editors added a photograph in the, uh, uh, in, in the, along with the journal article, which is a photograph of three infants, uh, properly multiracial, that's got to be politically correct. Uh, so three infants who seem to be more or less paying attention to one another. And the, sub, the title says, uh, Communication Without Syntax, Without Rules. So that shows that you can have communication without rules. Uh, they could have had a picture of three bacteria, which would have made the same point. Uh, they also communicate without syntax. Uh, but underlying this is a, a fundamental dogma, which is almost never questioned, though it's almost certainly false, and that is that language is just a system of communication. Now, there's every reason to believe that that's not true. Uh, in fact, again, obvious reasons. If you just introspect, uh, almost all of your use of language, like 99% of it, is internal. Uh, you can't go for a minute without talking to yourself. It takes a tremendous act of will uh, to stop talking to yourself. Well, that's obviously not communication. That's thinking. 
Uh, and that's almost all the use of language. In fact, it goes on all night, unfortunately. But, uh, uh, and even interaction, like you know, interaction among people, parts of it are communication, but a large parts aren't. They're just establishing social relations, uh, uh, whatever. Nevertheless, this dogma is widely held, and uh, that leads to the uh, assumption that you can understand something about language if you look at communication systems of other languages. That's what underlies the, all of the work on evolution of language. You take a look at this work, you find it's not about evolution of language at all. It's speculations, speculations, of course, about the evolution of communication to quite a different topic. It's not language. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, language is used for communication, but so is everything else we do, style of dress, uh, whatever. And the large parts of language aren't uh, use of language is only peripherally for communication. But if you think of language as just being a system of communication, then you can look at animal communication systems and you can see if you can uh, draw some uh, analogies or whatever. Actually, you can't very much, but uh, at least it's, it's not ridiculous. If you look at the properties of language, it's just instantly ridiculous, even the ones that I, simple ones that I mentioned. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, with regard to... Uh, uh, with regard to uh, communic uh, there, uh, also the title of the article, incidentally, uh, is also revealing. The title of the article is "Without Social Context?" Question mark. And what it's do the point is to criticize the idea that you can study language without paying attention to the social context of its use. Well, in fact, if you're studying communication, that's true. Uh, wouldn't make much sense to study communication without looking at the circumstances of its use. Uh, it's close to tautology. On the other hand, it's completely false of the study of the mechanisms that enter into communication or that enter into other aspects of life. And in other areas of the cognitive sciences and biology, that's just taken for granted. So, for example, if you study the structure of the digestive system, you can do that, in fact, you do do that without uh, asking uh, uh, what happens when you have a Big Mac or something. In fact, that you dismiss. You try to abstract away from that. Uh, if you're studying uh, in, the, in psych mental psychological systems, uh, there's very good work on, uh, say, object recognition by say, infants, uh, Elizabeth Spelke, Rene Bayer-Jean, others. Now, they look at the try to discover the mechanisms by experiment. Uh, it's without social context. They're not interested in, they don't look at it when two kids are playing. Maybe you can, but that's peripheral. You try to abstract away from that and carry out experimental studies in a, a, a refined situation in which there's no social context. That's the way you study it automatically, like anything else in the sciences. Uh, take one of the uh, major... Uh, discoveries of the uh, study of perception. Um, uh, one of the most interesting principles that was discovered was uh, uh, Shimon Ullman's uh, what's called rigidity principle. It was a pretty surprising fact. It turns out that if a person is presented with tachistoscopic images, you know, just dots in a screen, a few dots, maybe three or four dots on a screen, and you have several presentations of it, what you see, what you perceive, is a rigid object in motion. Uh, that's the structure that you impose on the sequence of a few dots on a screen. That's the rigidity principle, which is a pretty remarkable discovery, but has absolutely nothing to do with social context. Again, this is not even real objects. It's looking at gestoscopic images, uh, like most of the study of vision. Uh, so, and in fact, throughout the biological sciences, just as in chemistry or physics, uh, all of this is taken for granted. Uh, but in the study of language and higher human mental processes, this is considered something, to be something wrong with this. You just can't approach it in the manner of the sciences. Uh, the, uh, uh, so take, just take a concrete example. So this thing's in the way, so I won't write in the blackboard, but it's simple enough so you can keep it in mind. <clears throat> 
So take an actual sentence, say, of English. Uh, take the sentence, uh, they, wonder, uh, if, they wonder if the mechanics fix the cars. Okay. And suppose you want to ask a question about how many cars there were. You can say, how many cars did they wonder if the mechanics fixed? I suppose you want to ask the same question about the mechanics. Well, then it comes out, uh, how many mechanics do you wonder if fixed the cars? Well, there's plainly something wrong with that. Uh, you can't say that. Uh, it has a perfectly good meaning. It's fine thought, but they just can't express it in language. And that generalizes very widely. There's principles that underlie it, that extend to all sorts of other constructions. But did you... Uh, uh, do you have to study that in a social context or in a uh, you know, condition of communication? Uh, it, could it possibly be learned? I mean, did you have evidence that you're not allowed to say that or you can't say it? Uh, of course not. I mean, this is just something like the rigidity principle. It's some property of the system, which if you're willing to reach the stage of, say, Galileo, if you want to enter into modern science, you should be puzzled about uh, and that's a typical example, of a myriad examples of that kind. And any one of them illustrates the fact that if you want to understand anything about the properties of language, you're going to have to study it the way the sciences are pursued, even uh, the cognitive sciences in other domains. But that's contrary to the uh, dogmas. Well, uh, what's developed uh, out of this is uh, in modern cognitive science is a very strange concept of uh, scientific inquiry. It's, uh, it's not true of, say, the study of vision by Spelke, by Jean Ullman, and others, uh, but it is true of uh, uh, the, uh, especially the computational cognitive sciences, which have the merit that the proposals are clear enough so you can actually investigate them. They're not just hand-waving about, you know, everything happens like other primates. Uh, they actually have models that you can investigate, which is good. And what you can show is they fail 100% totally, and it doesn't make any difference because they succeed in terms of a new conception of science which dominates the computational cognitive sciences. Uh, the idea that science is a matter of uh, developing models that, ma that more or less approximate data, usually Bayesian methods of statistical analysis. And Bayesian methods have the nice property that whatever the data is, you can find a Bayesian analysis that will fit it. You just have to pick the, pick the right priors and so on and so forth. Not exactly fit it, but kind of come close. Uh, this is never done in the sciences. So, for example, if someone is studying, say, bee communication, you know, say, uh, the waggle dance of some species of bees, they don't proceed by taking uh, videotapes, massive videotapes of bees swarming, and then do a statistical analysis of them, you know, Bayesian analysis, and from which you could get a pretty good prediction of what's going to happen the next time bees swarm. But that's of absolutely no interest to bee scientists. And quite rightly, if you apply for an NSF grant to study it, they'll laugh at you. On the other hand, if you apply for an NSF grant to do the same thing with the corpus, a collection of spoken language, you get, get it right off. That's considered very sophisticated. Uh, or say physics. Uh, if, if, if trying to study physics, you don't take videotapes of what's happening outside the window, you know, leaves blowing around and so on and do an analysis of them and get, you know, pretty, if it's a massive collection, you get a pretty good prediction of what's going to happen tomorrow when uh, you look out the window. A prediction that's way better than any that a physicist can give. In fact, they can't give you any prediction at all, and they don't care about it. Uh, but the sciences just aren't done like that. Uh, the only thing that is done like that is... Uh, particular branches of the computational and other cognitive sciences that deal with higher mental faculties, language in particular. And there's a criterion of success. The criterion of success is you get a little better each time. 
you have more data, you know, more complicated Bayesian analysis, more sophisticated methods, and you get a little closer to the data. As I say, in any other domain, this would uh, simply be ridiculed, but it is the criterion of success in the computational cognitive sciences, novel approach. Uh, you can find it in all the major journals all the time, and, uh, uh, but only for language. Actually, not even for something as close to language as, say, a numerical calculation. So, for example, suppose you want to study the rather interesting fact, in fact, very surprising and puzzling fact, that uh, all humans uh, have a capacity for a numerical computation. That they understand the number system. Now, that's incidentally a, uh, a fact that did puzzle uh, the scientists who created the modern theory of evolution, Darwin and Wallace. Uh, they were kind of struck by the fact that all humans, that it, didn't experiment with it, they just recognized it was true, uh, that all humans have... Uh, comprehend the number system, which is very surprising from their point of view because it couldn't have been selected. Uh, it's barely been used in the whole history of humans. A small group of humans, mostly pretty modern and still small, uh, have uh, the, you know, made use of this system. But for most of almost entire human history, in fact, most humans in their day it just they never, never used it at all. I mean, they could handle small numbers, but so can apes. And they could handle what's called numerosity, you know, knowing that 100 things is more than 80 things, uh, but not the particular characteristics of the uh, digital uh, the number system, you know, the principles of multiplication or addition and so on. So where to come from? A uh, big puzzle for them. If it wasn't selected, how come it's there? Uh, in fact, Darwin and Wallace had a dispute over this, uh, the co-founders of Theory of Evolution. Wallace uh, argued that there has to be some principle in evolution apart from natural selection uh, to account for this mystery. And uh, Darwin didn't agree with that, but he absolutely he had no alternative suggestion. It remained a mystery. Uh, it has remained a mystery up to the present. The likely answer, which we can now begin to perceive, is that if you look at the actual mechanisms of language, if there's any time I may get to them, or at least something about them, but if you, get, if you take a look at them carefully, it turns out that uh, uh, if you simplify them radically, they in fact yield the number system. So it's very likely that uh, the number system just kind of piggybacked off language. If you have a language, however, that evolved, uh, you just get the number system as a free gift by simplifying the language, actually reducing the lexicon, the collection of words, to one element. Then the basic computational principles do give you a model of the number system, which may very well be where it comes from, which would, if true, overcome the mystery. Well, uh, uh, let's go on. This uh, I'll go back to uh, Enfield again, his useful collection of standard beliefs. Uh, he argues that language doesn't exist because it is entirely grounded in a constellation of cognitive capacities that each, taken separately, has other functions as well. So it exists in the sense that, say, today's weather exists. I mean, yeah, it does exist, but it's not a topic of scientific study. It's just a constellation of other factors that uh, operate independently. And the argument is that uh, that's true of language. There isn't a particle of evidence for this, but it's almost universally held in the cognitive science. It's not totally, but very widely. And in fact, as soon as you look at the simplest thing, you see it can't be true. Uh, so for example, uh, infant acquisition of language. Uh, or the one example that I mentioned, uh, how is that a constellation? Uh, uh, how, how can that... How can what you know about that follow from the interaction of other cognitive processes? And if so, how? I mean, if somebody makes this proposal, in the sciences at least, they'd be expected to give some evidence for it, look at some simple cases, but not in the cognitive sciences. It's enough to wave your hands at it. Uh, mention one uh, well-known th thesis in 
the study of acquisition of language. And one of the main figures in the field is Michael Tomasello. Those of you in the field are, are familiar with this. And his view is that language is just a structured inventory of linguistic constructions acquired by processes common to primates and others which are kind of obscure. So there's interrogative constructions and passive constructions, and uh, you just acquire them. They could be any other way. You know. It's just kind of accidental this way, and there's nothing more to say about them. Also notice that it would have to be finite. Well, obviously, it's not finite. Language is unbounded. So how does it become infinite? Well, that's just more hand-waving. Uh, uh, going back to Enfield, uh, talking about the evolution of the system, he says there are well-developed gradualist evolutionary arguments to support the conclusion that there's no such thing as language except as a complex of uh, independent com cognitive processes. Uh, notice the notion gradualist. That's a reflection of the mythology about evolution that's still maintained outside of biology. So I'm in evolutionary biology. Everyone knows that's false. But outside the field, even as close as... Uh, you know, cognitive neuroscience, it's still assumed that somehow everything has to be gradualist. It's well known that that's not true, uh, but it's uh, kind of what you learn in high school and people believe it uh, in, this, in the sciences too. He's particularly uh, upset about what he calls the saltationist argument, and it is saltationist, that the transition from finite to infinite was not gradualist. So natural language is clearly infinite. There's no bound on the uh, number of expressions that you can, in principle, uh, produce and understand, uh, just as there's no bound on the uh, uh, collection of triples of numbers, x, y, z, where z is the product of x and y. And in principle, if you had enough time and ener energy and so on, you could calculate it. Well, language is the same. So how do you get from finite to infinite? Well, the fact that that's saltationist, not gradualist, is about as controversial as the fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. There's no logically possible alternative. It has to be saltationist. But the, the fact that it is, is incompatible with the gradualist conceptions. Now, in a rational field, when you have some conception, and you have something that shows it's logically impossible, you give up the conception. But in a field that's dominated by dogmas, many of them ancient dogmas, what you do is deny the, logic, the, the facts, even if they're just logical truths. And that's unfortunately pretty common. Well, uh, what do we actually know about evolution of language? Not very much, in fact. But the little bit that is known uh, is highly suggestive. Uh, one thing we know, which is kind of surprising, if you're willing to be puzzled by simple things, uh, is that uh, all humans have the same capacity for language. Now, all humans haven't been studied, but a lot of linguistic groups have been studied, and there are no known group differences. There are individual differences, but they're found in all groups. So, for example, if you take uh, an infant from... Uh, a tribe in, say, Papua New Guinea that hasn't had contact with other humans for you know tens of thousands of years, uh, and you bring it to Boston, and its child is raised here, it'll be just like you. Same linguistic capacities, same cognitive capacities, go on to become a quantum physicist, and so on. And conversely, you take an infant from here, put it in Papua New Guinea, same thing happens. And in fact, as far as is known, uh, there are either n no or very marg at most very marginal differences among human groups in cognitive capacities al altogether, uh, but in linguistics capacities, so, if they exist, they're so min minute you can't find them by present methods, so very marginal at most. Uh, well, humans, uh, we all descend from a fairly small group that uh, left Africa maybe 50,000 years ago, something like that. And that, what that means is for the past 50,000 years, there's been zero evolution, none. There's been change, but change is not evolution. You know, 
or the fact that uh, we're different from uh, hunter-gatherers in our cultures and size and everything else, uh, that's, uh, those are signs of change, but not evolution. If there is evolution, it's very superficial. Things like, say, skin color, and hair length, things like that, uh, but not in fundamental human capacities, as far as anyone can tell. So that's 50,000 years with no evolution at all, which is striking. That means that whatever, for language, uh, whatever evolved was kind of rigid, never changed again. Uh, it, you know, of course, languages differ, but that's not evolution. That's just something else. You know. Like the Norman conquest uh, changed English enormously. It made it kind of like French, but that's not evolution. If languages change the way they do, say, by the effect of teenage jargon or something, which is a very big effect on language change, it's not evolution. It's just changes that take place within a fixed system. And the system seems to be pretty rigid for 50, at least 50,000 years. Well, if you go back about 50,000 years before that, you just find no evidence that language even existed. Uh, the evidence, and it's commonly accepted by paleoanthropologists that sometime in that narrow window, there was something that sometimes Jared Diamond called uh, a great leap forward. There's a short period in which there's a sudden explosion of complex uh, artifacts, uh, uh, complex social structures, uh, 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 symbolic behavior, um, some representational art, uh, um, uh, 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 taking uh, calculation of uh, astronomical events like you know phases of the moon and so on. Uh, all of this happened, at least in the archaeological record, very brief period, maybe roughly 75,000 years ago. You can double the numbers if you like or triple them and nothing much changes. It's because uh, these numbers are all so small that from an evolutionary point of view, they don't matter. Uh, and again, that's millions of years after the separation from uh, other, organi other surviving organisms. Uh, the, uh, well, that seems uh, pretty clear and it's highly suggestive about the nature of language. Uh, one critical property of language, crucial property, uh, in fact, like the core property of language, is that each language consists of, at its root, of some mechanism. It's called a generative process, uh, a mechanism which constructs uh, an infinite array of structured expressions uh, which have interpretations at uh, in two systems, two interfaces, they're called sensory motor system, you know, for making noises or signs or whatever, and thought systems for thinking, planning, interpretation, and so on. Each of these structured expressions has to be mapped into those two systems. And, that, and it's unbounded. As I said, there's, and it's also digital, like, like the numbers. Like there's a five-word sentence, a six-word sentence, there's no five-and-a-half-word sentence. And it goes on indefinitely, as long as you have patience, time, and so on. And virtually everything that's produced is actually novel uh, in your own experience, maybe in the history of the language, because the, scale, the size of these uh, sets is so astronomical that you just keep producing new things. Well, that's the most elementary property of language. Now, around 19, by around 1950, uh, generative processes like that were understood from a mathematical point of view. They really hadn't been in the past. Uh, but, uh, you know, algorithms, they're called, or, you know, the, the kind of program that you can write for your laptop, let's say. Uh, these things began to be understood and understood pretty well. So it was possible to ask uh, what kind of a generative process could have these properties. Well, uh, uh, how, how could such a... Uh, Notice that it, it came apparent, given the limited evolutionary evidence, it must have happened pretty suddenly. That's a very brief window. So presumably what happened, it's hard to think of an alternative, is that in some small group, these are hunter-gatherer societies, remember, like 100 people or something, in some small group uh, uh, wandering around Africa somewhere, uh, some individual uh, underwent a slight mutation which led to a small rewiring of the brain, 
which provided a generative procedure. Now, mutations take place in individuals, not in groups. So it would have been one person who was lucky enough, or maybe unlucky enough, to undergo this mutation. And that mutation provided a, gener a generative procedure. But remember, it was one person. Hence, there's no possibility of communication. Uh, if this generative procedure produced structures that were linked to pre-existing conceptual systems, that individual could think, it could uh, plan, it could interp interpret, and so on. Well, that presumably yields some selectional advantage. Uh, a mutation can be transferred to offspring, <laughs> usually is, partially at least, uh, and that means over time there might have been a, enough people in this small group so that somebody would have gotten the idea that it's a, it might be useful to externalize it, to map this internal system into a, a, a something that can be perceived by others, maybe sound, maybe sign, you know, maybe tactile, whatever it might be. Well, that process of externalization is a very tricky one. The internal system that developed, notice, would have had no selectional pressures. Couldn't have. It's just some, something that happened internally. So therefore, it would have developed solely in terms of a, a natural law. It would be something like a snowflake. just takes on a perfect form because there's... There's no external pressures on it. So you'd expect an internal system to develop, uh, which is kind of like a snowflake, uh, perfect in some sense. And since these are computational systems, what that would presumably me mean is that it's, it's computationally efficient. It meets uh, perfect conditions of computational complexity. Well, a certain amount is known about computational complexity enough to set pretty strict conditions on what that might be like. Uh, so what we would predict if, if we're investigating language is that there's an internal system, uh, perfect in a sense, that is as computationally efficient as a system of this kind can be, uh, which connects to the two interfaces. Uh, one of them, the interface, the mapping to the thought Thought systems, again, has no external uh, uh, forces acting on it, so that ought to be perfect, too. And also invariant, uh, wouldn't change because there's no pressures. On the other hand, the mapping to the sensory motor system is quite complex. Sensory motor system has been, been around for hundreds of thousands of years. There's pretty good evidence for that. And it had nothing to do with the internal system. So the finding the connection between the internal system and the data produced by the sensory motor system, that's a complex cognitive problem. And you can, you can expect it will be solved in many different ways. And in fact, it is. That's the task fa faced by every infant. An infant gets some data from the sensory motor system, has to figure out how to ma map it to what may very well be a virtually invariant and maybe perfectly des designed uh, internal system of syntax and semantics. And as far as we know, about, uh, one of the pretty obvious, you know, uh, overwhelmingly, I mean, uh, I mean, the, the facts about language that are getting better and better established as research con condition continues, is that while the ex externalization systems vary enormously and are pretty complex, the internal system, the syntax and semantics, they seem close to invariant, uh, which is to be expected because there's very little evidence for them. They're very much like that one example that I gave. You have almost no evidence for it. So they must follow from rigid uh, principles which are there because they're computationally efficient and, and may not have changed for, let's say, 75,000 years, whatever. They certainly haven't changed for 50 years. Well, when you study a language, what do you study? You study the externaliza externalization. You learn the sounds. You learn the 
arbitrary word, meaning association is not quite arbitrary, but somewhat. Uh, you learn the irregular verbs. You, know. you learn the order of words, uh, things like that. Those are all parts of externalization. You don't learn the syntax and the semant semantics. Uh, for one thing, nobody can teach it to you because it's barely understood. Uh, for another thing, you, you know it already. It's part of your nature. And the same is true of the child acquiring language. Uh, that's roughly the, uh, these are the general facts that we observe. Uh, they fit pretty well to this uh, story, uh, this picture. And uh, uh, that looks like the uh, direction in which uh, linguistic inquiry ought to go. Uh, and it is internal to what's called the generative enterprise, but quite separate from uh, beliefs and d doctrines in the cognitive sciences, uh, especially the computational cognitive sciences. Uh, and I stress again, it's a kind of a harsh judgment, and I don't have time to talk about it, that there are literally no results in the computational cognitive science with regard to language. It's a huge literature, but if you look closely, the only results are in terms of this a novel concept of scientific inquiry that I mentioned and which has to do with matching data, uh, not known in any other field, even in cognitive psychology. Well, there's, uh, there's a lot to say about this, but it's getting late. So let me just make one final point. Any computational system, whatever it is, has to have sort, sort of atoms of computation you know, minimal elements that are operated on by the computational principles. Let's say any system you program for your laptop, uh, any computational procedure. So it has to be true, true of language. Now those are roughly word-like, first approximation, not really. So we can take word, words, first approximation, to be the minimal atomic elements. Well, where do they come from? Here's something else that one should be puzzled about. Uh, how are words related to the external world? A word like, say, cow or person or table or ri river or anyone you pick. There's a dogma about this, as there is in most things connected with la language. The dogma is what's called the referentialist dogma. Uh, a child learns the, the word cow because it sees a cow and somebody says cow and an association is established between the cow and the word, and that's the meaning of the word. Again, the simplest invest investigations show that this is totally false. It's, it's interesting. It's pretty much true for, it may be completely tr true for animal communication. Uh, every animal communication system that's known consists of atoms, fi finite number of them, of course, uh, which, like, say, uh, which, which are tied to particular, partic particular mind-independent events, events that a physicist could describe. So, say, um, a monkey, a vervet monkey, may have, say, five calls. Uh, one of them is, we, ca we call it a warning call. It's connected to uh, leaves moving in the trees, mm -hmm. vervets. Sees leaves moving the trees, it emits this call, and other vervets run away. Uh, or, or it could be, uh, uh, I'm hungry, you know, some hormonal change, which is identifiable. And as far as is known, that's what animal communication systems are like. It's completely false for human language. Uh, there are no <coughs> mind-independent uh, properties, properties that can be identified by a physicist that correlate with uh, the words and are, constitute their meanings, what they're referred to. In fact, the meanings of wor words really just give kind of perspectives, cognitive perspectives, uh, that you can employ in uh, discussing and referring to the world. Uh, there's no time to give examples, but uh, it's literally true, true of just about everything. Actually, this was pretty well understood in the 17th and 18th century, but it's been interesting work on it. It's mostly forgotten. Well, that raises a very serious problem. For one thing, it's a problem of where these things come from. Uh, how do they get into it? must be that they're internal. 
Uh, every child knows them. You don't learn them. You can't learn them. Very comp complex when you look at them. They're invariant. They're about, if they're different in various languages, very minor differences. Uh, and how did they evolve? That's a total mystery. In fact, such, such a deep mystery that it's very possible that there'll never be any insight into it. Well, let me stop, stop there. Well, we would like to thank Professor Chachovsky very, very much for this opportunity to, to come to, to speak for us this evening. And we will open the floor for a few questions. Um, so if you'd like to raise your hand, um, I can come, give you the microphone. Any questions? Thank you. Professor, uh, my name's Frank. Over here. Sorry. Over here. How you doing? Uh, you talked, you were critical of uh, what you call gradualism in, in evolution. Oh. You were critical of what you called gradualism in evolution and right. how people think that uh, it happens slowly over time. And then you talked about how 50,000 years ago, compared to now, we've changed relatively little. Uh, I was just curious how, how that works. They seem like contradictory ideas to me. I was just curious what you meant by that. By, by what? By, by, by why nothing changed in 50,000 years? Well, you said we haven't really changed that much. Barely. Yeah, no. but then you, uh, I feel like that is evidence of gradualism. And no, I feel no. like you were critical it's of gradualism. It goes against gradualism. It goes against gradualism. Yeah, okay. if, if uh, you know, there's just constant evolutionary change, small, small changes, uh, why should it have stopped? somewhere before 50,000 years ago. On the other hand, if what happened in human cognition is that some rigid system were developed suddenly for reasons having to do with nat natural law, uh, a mutation, a rewiring of the brain, a computational complexity, and so on, but then there's no reason to expect it to change. I mean, maybe it'll change someday with another mutation, but uh, there's no reason to expect the small changes. So this doesn't prove that uh, evolution is not gradualist. It's just consistent with the view that it isn't, which we know anyway. Any other uh, thank you, Professor, for your very generous talk. Um, mm -hmm. I just had a um, kind of a reflection, I sort of. Um, so I was interested in one comment you made about uh, about kind of conscious and non-conscious processes and how the kind of the functional aspect of your proposal is, is more or less non-conscious, whereas there's a kind of a conscious component, which is like our everyday lived experience, which is not kind of uh, going to be, uh, be able to introspect upon this functional system. So I was wondering, um, more on a philosophical note, what, how exactly we're supposed to think about phenomenal experience and kind of conscious experience in terms of its relationship to functional relationships, like your, um, specifically your linguistic proposal, but then also um, the other domain-specific proposals like uh, perception. Um, there are those who don't believe that perception is, mo is you know, modul um, modular or domain-specific, that it's embodied or something to that effect. So I wonder if you had any proposed um, reflections on this kind of um, research now and uh, how this relates to kind of our phenomenal lived experience. Well, let's take visual perception, uh, which uh, yes, is relatively uncontroversial. And take the one example that I gave, the rigidity principle. Okay, when, when you're looking at that sequence of tachistoscopic presentations, you perceive a rigid object in, mo in motion. You can't prevent yourself from perceiving that. That's what you perceive, period. Uh, what you're actually, the stimuli that are actually reaching your, uh, your, uh, uh, your eyes, your retina, are just a series of as few as three or four uh, presentations on a tachistoscope 
you know, screen with lights, uh, of uh, each of which has several dots on it. Well, you have no way of introspecting into that. Your phenomenal ex experience is a rigid object in motion. But the stimuli that are hitting the retina are a very small number of uh, pre presentations of a few dots. You can't introspect into that. Uh, the, in fact, it's a, that's why it's a discovery. You know, it's kind of like the discovery of the chemical structure of uh, you know, coal, coal or something. You can't uh, introspect into it. Uh, so the phenomenal descriptions, you know, they're useful, but uh, they're useful uh, as data. They tell you very little about what's going on. So it's kind of like everything else in the world, where you have data, but it doesn't tell you much about what's going on. Uh, that requires, that's why you have to take courses in physics and chemistry and so on, you know, because the data isn't, transpa isn't transparent. And it's hard for people to deal with. But the same is true of our uh, conscious lives. I mean, we tend to take for granted, kind of like, you know, it's just normal, that, that we can understand everything about ourse ourselves. In fact, we don't understand anything about ourselves. It's just, it's even harder than understanding uh, how uh, chemistry works, because it's so much more complex. And that's, that's the crucial step that the human sciences really have not take, taken yet, for the most part, uh, that was taken in the natural sciences around the 17th century. Just the willingness to be puzzled about things that look obvious. Like, what could be more obvious than if I, in fact, that if I let go of a cup, it goes down instead of up? Well, you know, Galileo was willing to be puzzled about that. That's why you take physics courses. Uh, before that, all you had to be told is things are going to their natural place. And uh, it's a big uh, psychological step, even in studying the uh, external world, even greater in studying ourselves, because there we sort of feel that we, we know everything. What's conscious must be what there is. And in, the, in philosophy, modern philosophy, it's, it's kind of a principle. It happened to be John Searle who I was quoting, but it's a widely... Uh, accepted principle that nothing can be a mental process unless it's accessible to consciousness. And as I mentioned, if you look over the intellectual history, it's very hard to find anyone who departed from this view. Okay, we'll um, take time for one more question because it's getting late and someone over here had raised their hand. Uh, yes, Professor. Um, you mentioned the, the problems behind the uh, referential dogma. Um, would you say that we are in a, uh, if we reject that, are we in a situation that, that Quine maybe puts us in with the... Sorry, sorry are we in a situation uh, similar to Quine's indeterminacy of translation? Would you, would you say that's where we're left? Well, or? Quine accepted the dogma, but that's not surprising because almost everybody does today, too. Uh, yeah, his... Uh, his idea, his doctrine of indeterminacy was in fact based on assuming this. So if you take his framework that there's nothing but association and conditioning, uh, how, do you, how do you know to take his example? Uh, when you hear uh, a word, let's say rabbit is his case, when a ch child hears the word rabbit, how does it know that the word is referring to the... Uh, that animal running around, <laughs> sorry, and not to some part of the animal. Because if you see the animal running around, its leg is also running around. So how does the child know that it's not the leg? You know? And uh, how does it not know, in fact, uh, that the word doesn't refer to some disconnected object, like uh, the leg of this one and the head of another one and so on? Uh, that's a standard pro problem of induction. It's Hume's problem of induction. And as Hume understood, but his successors don't seem to understand, there's no way to solve that problem. Hume himself, contrary to what you may learn in a philosophy course, was a rationalist, not an empiricist. He took for granted and says 
that the only way you can solve the problem of induction is by what he calls an animal instinct. It means there must be some internal structure in your mind that leads you to, the, to a particular answer, because there's no way to get it by induction. And that, I think, is correct. And I think the same would be true about uh, Quine's uh, Galaga, you know, rabbit. Uh, the child gets the right, right answer because they're built to get the right answer. And the right answer is not a, uh, in the case of, say, rabbit, you can easily show that what a child understands to be a rabbit is not something physically identifiable. Uh, I'm kind of guessing your ages, but say my grandchildren, probably about your age, when they were kids, uh, the story that they liked about a uh, baby donkey named Sylvester. And uh, so some of you know, uh, the baby donkey somehow has turned into a rock. And for the rest of the story, it's trying to conv convince its parents that it's not a rock, it's their baby donkey. And since children's stories always end happily, uh, something happens and it, it ends up and it's a baby donkey again and everybody's happy. But the interesting fact is that every child understands that that thing that has all the physical properties of a rock is in fact Sylvester. Uh, and the reason is, and this was in fact noticed by John Locke, that uh, people, and in fact animals, are individuated by properties like psych psychic continuity. Okay, you're the same if you, there's some psychic continuity no matter how you change physically. I mean, that's the standard fairy tale. You know, you know the uh, evil witch turns the handsome prince into a frog and he has all the properties of a frog until, until the beautiful princess comes and kisses the frog. Then he's a handsome witch again, a uh, handsome uh, prince again. Well, again, every kid knows that it's always the prince because it has the property of psych psychic continuity. Actually, a lot of science fiction is based on this, but it's even true of uh, the children's stories. Well, that alone tells you right away that uh, uh, what individuates objects is not a, a collection of physical properties, but some complex mental structure that we impose on them, like, like psychic continuity. And uh, Hume didn't think about that. Uh, Locke, in fact, did. But uh, uh, I should say Hume recognized that it was true, that we don't identify words by uh, physical properties. Uh, but it runs across the whole collection of words. You can't find a, a word so simple that it doesn't have those properties. Actually, in the natural sciences, what you try to do is to concoct, you invent concepts which do have those properties. So when you invent the concept, uh, say, uh, you know, electron or something, you intend it to be physically identifiable. You don't want it to have its meaning changed by what's in your head. You know, that's the whole point. So it's a kind of a norm for, for the sciences, but it's just not true of human language. And that goes back to Quine's example. Now, the solution to his problem is essentially Hume's. Hume's solution to the problem of induction. No solution, except you're built to pick things up, to, uh, to structure the world in a certain way. So that's the way you do it. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for giving us some insight into your area of expertise. We'd like to present to you a small token of our appreciation. Um, and we'd love to have you back any time you'd have us. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Noam Chomsky. Thank you very much.